Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Kim and I am a wine entertainer and the marketing and events coordinator for Calvert Woodley. So I have always been behind the scenes of planning all of our virtual tastings thus far. And today I'm kind of taking a step out and doing a tasting uh, for you all. So thank you for being here. Um, just wanna say a really big thank you to everyone who, everyone here and everyone that's just continually supporting Calvert Woodley and these tastings. You know, as a local family owned small business, it really means a lot to have a bunch of loyal customers like you all. So, just want to say thank you for that. Um, yeah, and in terms of planning this tasting, you know, our theme tonight is rose and cheese pairing. And uh, myself and the La Cheeserie, we had a really fun time curating this tasting for you. So I'm so excited to see that there were a lot of signups, a lot of people really excited about the topic and the tasting. So I can't wait to get into it. And uh, we'll be kicking off tonight uh, with a little bit of wine basic information and then get into the tasting. So the first, so I'll kind of start chatting a little bit in the beginning and then we'll actually get into the more dialogue part. So as you're kind of settling into the tasting, please pour yourself a glass of the Tomoresca Califura uh, Salento. This is the first rosé we're gonna be having tonight. It's, it's the one with the woman wearing the hat. I think it's probably my favorite. So I'm gonna pour myself a little bit of that too. So I can join in on the fun. Yeah, so feel free to start sipping that. And as you are joining, um, please just try to remain on mute. Uh, I will pause and you know let you guys all jump in with questions throughout. So at that point you can unmute. Feel free to also utilize the chat box. But since it is me talking and um, you know looking at the chat box, I will probably get to those questions towards the end and maybe if I see them in between. So that's just sort of a, a maintenance thing. But alrighty, so let's get into it. So yeah, start with your glass and feel free to start you know snacking on your cheeses, if you've got any other snacks with you, but just make sure you keep a little bit of cheese for um, later so you can try them with the wines, all right? So I'm gonna share a little, some little visuals because that's always helpful when we're tasting wine. So give me one second to share my screen here. Okay. Uh, the first wine is gonna be the Tomoresca Califura. It's the one with the woman wearing the hat on the front, it's the Italian one. So that's the one we're gonna start with. So feel free to pour yourself a little bit of that. Okay. Okay, so let's, let me pull this up for everyone. And, okay, great. All right, here comes the presentation, just to kind of give us some visuals here. All right, everyone, so please give me a thumbs up if you can see it, just wanna make sure we're good to go. Okay, I see some thumbs up, awesome. Full screen mode. All right, so again, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Tonight, this is gonna be our pairing. So we're starting off with the Tomoresca um, Califura Rosé Salento. 2020, and it's going to be paired with the Pecorino. So that is going to be the cheese that uh, has the, the one without the brown rind. And it sort of looks like this. It's kind of got, it's a little bit dry, but it's a, you know, chewy or hard cheese. And then the, um, the second cheese will be the, or sorry, the second one will be the Chateau Paradis Rosé. That's the Provence Rosé. So like, so it, it's an order on the screen as well. And that'll be with the goat cheese and I'm gonna, there we go. This is amazing. You're gonna have so much fun eating this. And then the last wine will be our Tavel. That's what we'll end with. And that is gonna be with the aged Manchego, which has this brownish rind. So just keep that in mind as we go through. Again, just save some cheese. Feel free to start eating early. Okay, I see some people are raising hands. Do you all have questions? If so, feel free to um, unmute and ask. And if not, I'm gonna kind of jump in. Okay, all right, I think we're good to go. So I'm just gonna start off as you're enjoying your wine, giving you all a really brief rundown of what is wine because I know you all know, but sometimes we want a little bit of a reminder, especially when we get into tasting. So therefore, the first thing we're gonna do is um, just briefly, simply put, wine is fermented grape juice, right? It's made with the Venice vinifera grape species and the fermented, you pick it, you crush it, 
you ferment the juice and it becomes wine. So it's very, very simple. But I think one of the bigger questions that I always get asked whenever I'm doing tastings is how does wine get all of its flavors? And the interesting thing about that is that it really can come from four different things. And tonight we'll talk about three of those. <laughs> um, we, we'll kind of talk about it with the, the last one with the Tavel, but our Tavel is not aged. So those four things that give wine flavor, and this is just something to remember as you're going through the tasting, is the grape variety, the terroir, or the land where the grapes are grown, winemaking techniques, and aging. So the grape variety itself, we'll talk about what grape varieties are in the different rosés we're having tonight. And you know, each grape variety has its own distinct uh, set of flavors. And you know, that's pretty typical amongst that grape variety um, just in general. However, the second way that wine gets its flavors is also through where it's grown. You know, it is an agricultural product, which means that it picks up the, uh, the flavors of the land. And that is what the term, the French term terroir, uh, means is that wine tastes like where it comes from. So therefore that is why you have the ability to, you know, taste a wine that is a Chardonnay from France and then have a Chardonnay from California. And it's still Chardonnay, but it tastes different because it's grown in different places. So uh, we, we won't be doing any comparisons like that tonight, but that is just something to keep in mind in future tastings. And uh, the last thing is also the winemaking techniques. So whether or not you're using oak aging on the wine, that can affect the flavor and also texture and a few other technical things. And then we also have aging. So of course with rosés, rosés are meant to be uh, consumed pretty pretty much right away. I mean, these are 2020, you wanna have them really fresh. And so we're not really gonna worry about that tonight. Um, so let's get into just a little bit uh, more info about rosé. And for everyone that is just joining, I don't have the chat up right now, so I will get to the chat questions after I'm done kind of sharing this little bit here. Okay, so we're talking about rosé tonight. Our first wine for everyone just joining is this one, the Tomoresca Calfuris from Salento, Italy. It's the one with the woman wearing the hat. So um, we're starting off with that tonight. And when you're making rosé, there are a few different ways, and we're going to taste a few different versions of that tonight. So the first way to make rosé is skin contact maceration. And essentially, I have a nice little diagram for you here, but it is the most common way for making quality rosé. And in winemaking, you know, what actually gives wine its color are the grape skins. So we're kind of playing a little a little game of um, dyeing wine here, right? So whenever you pick your wines and then you crush them to initially let the juice out, that juice is normally clear. And, and if you're just cleaning, don't forget. All right. That was loud. Don't forget to mute here if you're joining. All right, thank you. Alrighty, so. Starting off with um, when you're making rosé, what you're, what you're doing. So a winemaker is gonna get the grapes into the winery. They're gonna crush the grapes, which releases some of the juice out. This is the first process you're doing with all winemaking. And that juice of the grapes is usually clear. So it's coming out, it's clear. And what actually gives wine, a rosé, and especially a red wine, its color are the grape skins. Uh, the grape skins also contribute some factors uh, for structure on the palate for things like tannins. But you know, for our rosés, we're just kind of worrying about color and flavor tonight. So um, when you're doing skin contact maceration, what that means is that you crush the grapes, you leave the skins with the juice just for a little bit, maybe two hours, up to 24. Some people even do it for 48. And um, depending on how long you leave the skins with the juice, you're kind of dyeing the wine a, a certain shade. So you can kind of see that in this diagram here. And so after that time that the winemaker wants to leave the skins with the juice, they take the skins away and they le let the juice ferment. And then it starts, you know, it becomes rosé. So if you wanted to make red wine, you would just leave it on there. You would leave the skins with the juice on there the whole time. So that is one way and we'll definitely uh, come across that as well. And then another way is also direct pressing. This is creating the lightest rosés and uh, the lightest colored rosés, I should say. So it's kind of this first one here on the, the far left. And um, yes, so that is one way, uh, another way of making rosé. And when you're direct pressing, you're taking your red grapes, you are, um, you're kind of crushing them and taking the skins away right away. But when you initially crush the grapes and let the juice run out, the juice gets a little bit of a dye from the skin. So that's a direct pressing method, just a slight color. And a lot of your, the Provence we're having is actually that method as well. 
then a third method is the uh, sangi, sangi. I'm, I'm tough with the French terms, or the bleeding method. And so this is actually something that was uh, started initially to concentrate red wines. And so what you would do is you would um, have your ju your grapes juice and your grape skins in a vat, and you know, kind of you're starting to let it soak and macerate to make a red wine. And then in order to actually concentrate the red wine, you might drain some of the juice out so that there is a higher uh, higher ratio of juice to skins with the wine. And so um, that's like to concentrate red wines. However, when you're draining off that juice, you can still do something with it. And a lot of uh, winemakers are using it to make rosé. So we'll see that with one of the wines here tonight. And then of course, the last way is to blend, which I will say um, is, I don't know, it's it's not the most common in, in most parts of Europe. It's actually outlawed. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, in the new world, it's a little bit more of a common practice. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's like that's blending a red and a white wine. I mean, you can actually make rosés and kind of blend them a little bit together at the end. But yeah, doing the red and whites is, yeah, it's, it's a no-go in Europe. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so that those are our four basic ways of making rosé. And as we go through the rosés tonight, I'll let you know what we're having. So with that being said, oh, okay, we have someone still joining, perfect. Okay, so with that being said, let's get into our first wine. And if you're having trouble hearing me, I am so sorry. <clears throat> let's see here. Okay, well, please give me a, you know, a wave or send another message if you really can't hear me. All right, we got Andrew coming back in here. Okay, great. So uh, let's get into our first rosé. So this is the Tomoresca from Califura, or sorry, Tomoresca Califura. Tomoresca is the winemaker. Califura is just kind of the name of the wine. And this wine comes from uh, Salento in Italy. And with that being said, um, just want you all to take a quick, you know, sniff of the wine, just to get kind of introduced to it. You know, when we are wine tasting, I always like to remind people that, you know, we've all come from different places, experienced uh, different foods and cuisines and smells throughout our time. So what we smell in wine is going to be a little bit different than the next person. So I'm going to challenge you all in a little bit to, you know, tell me what you all are smelling. So just get acquainted with this one. I know you've been sipping it, um, but I wanna make sure that you all uh, are starting to enjoy it. I always like to say, you're taking your wine on a date. You're really just getting to know it. So um, I will share a little bit more about the winery and then we'll taste, forgot about this one. Okay, so we have our uh, Tormoresca wine here. Um, and this, I have a lovely map here to kind of help you all out. So um, this map here, uh, this wine comes from uh, the Puglia area or a, a Puglia is kind of, I guess, the more traditional term, but that white circle shows the Salento section of Puglia in Italy. And so that is where these grapes are coming from. And specifically, uh, the grape we're having in here is Negro Romaro, which is a red grape, of course. And Negro Romaro is, um, it's grown really in abundance in Puglia and almost nowhere else. So it's really kind of the classic grape of this area. And it typically produces wines with really rich black fruits, um, black fruit flavors, maybe a little bit hint of like dried herbs. So just start to think about that as we're, as you're sniffing your wine here. Um, and it's also in this area commonly blended. It's usually the predominant uh, wine of the blend, but if it is blended with something, it is blended with Malvesa Nera, Sangiovese, or the Montepulciano grape. So those are some common, um, you know, blendings for this grape. Uh, however, though, you know, we have the Tomoresca winery, and that is, you know, where the this wine is coming from. And they named their winery Tomoresca because it's uh, it's referring to the ancient seaside towers that overlook the Adriatic Sea. So as you're sipping this wine, you can really just picture that you're on this lovely kind of plateau hilltop because they are sort of elevated here where the vineyards are. And um, you can imagine seeing the ocean in the distance and it's just beautiful and the sea breezes and you're smelling your lovely wine and uh, yeah, things are on just gorgeous, right? I mean, I have this photo here, it's beautiful. So um, with that being said, the actual uh, vineyards where these grapes are coming from from Tomoresca is on the Masare Meme estate. It's 
so hard to pronounce, I'm not Italian. Um, and this is in the Salento area, of course, in that white circle on the graph here. And, um, you know, this is right along the Adriatic coast. It's elevated a little bit, so you're just getting some really good sun. But, of course, those cooling breezes from the, the vineyard being on the peninsula. So that's kind of how these red grapes will retain their acidity. Okay. All right. So as, uh, as we're smelling wine here, I always like to tell people that it's, you know, when wine professionals are really getting into wine and learning about it, they are looking at a list of aromas to help them figure out what they're smelling. So don't feel like too self-conscious if you're, you know, having trouble coming up with stuff because this is really a time for um, everyone to sort of jump in here. So take a sip of your wine, uh, aerate a little bit, this allows the aromas to come out. All right, and I'll kick it off. I will say that I start off with some fresh peach. That's kind of the first thing that comes to mind for me. And now I'm gonna encourage you, so who feels uh, brave here and wants to um, share what they're smelling here? <laughs> feel free to jump in, feel free to unmute, right in the chat. Okay, Diane said watermelon. I totally agree with the watermelon. Anyone else? Let's see. Strawberries, cantaloupe. Ooh, yes, definitely some melon. I smell orange. Ooh, mm -hmm. I would agree with that as well. Apricot, yes, stone fruits, melon, berries. This wine has a lot of stuff going on. And that's, again, coming from the, um, the Negromaro grape variety, right? Mm. More strawberries in the chat. Fruit tree, as it shifts from blossoms to actual fruit. Ooh. Yes, there is something floral about it, right? Something floral, for sure. Lavender, mm, love it, love it. Okay. All right, so uh, if you haven't already, take a sip of your wine, just, just get acquainted with the flavor. It's always what I like to say, kind of start with the flavor. Mm. Mm. It's got some lovely tartness, right? So Negro Romaro is, is great for Red wines, of course, it's getting your intense flavor, some good acidity, and that's really coming out in the rosé here too. So let's see. And as you're wine tasting, you know, what people, what I guess I would say the professional wine tasters, like what they're looking for initially, of course, is pleasant aromas and you want to have good fruit on the palate, something that really sits and, um, you know, sits well, is really pleasant on the finish, but you're also looking at more of the texture when you're tasting. So now we're going to get into the part where, of course, we're going to be continuing to talk about this wine, but I also want to share a few things to help you figure out what it is that you like in wine, because that's part of the thing of wine tasting, right? So one of, um, I guess, the five kind of structural components that you're going to be looking for on your palate are acidity, sweetness, body, tannins, and alcohol. So um, we won't be having any sweetness in our wine tonight. These are all dry rosés, but I will say that as a distinction, um, sweetness in wine can sometimes be confused with fruitiness. So we're going to, you know, this first rosé has a nice powerful fruit to it. So you may take a sniff and be like, oh, it's, it smells sweet. But really, I would say what you're most likely smelling instead is actually super ripe fruit. So just keep that in mind as you're going throughout, uh, you know, your tasting and the wine world and that sort of thing. Because if you were to go to a store like Calvert Woodley or to a restaurant and you were like, I want something sweet, you know, most of the time the person's going to be like, I know you actually want something fruity, but if they dessert wine and you didn't want that, then that's no good. So keep that in mind. And um, uh, so the other thing about rosé that I just want to point out with this one is tasting for acidity. So when you're tasting for acidity, what you're looking for is the feeling of sourness on your palate and how prevalent that is. So when you're doing that, you're going to take a sip of your wine. And if you feel the back sides of your tongue, kind of the back part of your mouth, really start to water, 
then you know that there is some acidity there. And there's acidity in all wine, but in different quantities. And you want it to be really in balance with, of course, the fruit flavors, the body, if there are tannins, and um, just the flavors and like everything that's about the wine. So I uh, encourage you all to take another sip, hold the wine in, your in the back of your mouth just for a little bit, uh, a few seconds, just to get you know, the feeling of the acidity. And of course, don't hold there too long because it could be intense. And so just swallow it. Mm. Mm. And when you're tasting for acidity, you're looking at a spectrum. So you, uh, the spectrum is low, medium, and high acidity is typically what it's classified as. And, um, you know, it really is just based on how much your mouth waters, how much the puck, you're puckering up from your, from your wine. So it's, it might be a little bit difficult to classify this one right away if you're not comparing it to other ones. But as we go throughout tonight, you know, we're going to be getting um, a little, a bigger picture of different types of acidity in wine and how it shows up. So, you know, for this one, it felt, you know, quite medium to me, maybe pushing to high a little bit, but it's, it's definitely got a good balance with the fruit. It doesn't overpower anything else in the palate, which I am really happy about. And um, something that I would encourage you all to pay attention, especially as you are feeling for the acidity in the wine, is do you like it? So if you like the acidic feeling, then you know, okay, I should be, you know, asking for wines that have a little more acidity to really explore more. Um, you know, some of those being like Savion Blanc and, um, uh, oh, Acertico, you know, from Greece, like those really highly acidic wines and that sort of thing. So that will be, um, that's kind of a way to kind of um, break it down in your mind so you can figure out what it is that you really like. So, but going back to our Tormoresca, now that we've been sitting here and enjoying it, um, how do you all feel about the flavor on the palate? I would love to know if there was any differences or if anything else showed up. Feel free to also write in the chat. <laughs> Or unmute yourself. That's also fine too. So I think it uh, it definitely the flavor seems to change when you hold it in the back of your throat a little bit to to mm -hmm. to try to detect the acidity. Like to me, then the flavor is altered just a smidgen than just having a quick drink. Yeah. Yeah, you're getting more focused on the that texture of the acidity, right? It's really coming out, but yeah, it almost feels like I'm getting a little bit more freshness when I do that because I am, you know, focusing on the, um, the acidity. I love that. Uh, anyone else here? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm checking the chat. Still have lavender. I agree that that's what it tastes like. All right. Oh, we have more here. Great pairing with the cheese. Yes, we'll get to that in one second. So as you are enjoying this, um, I just wanna say uh, just a little more information about this wine because you know what, that's what we're here for, right? So Califuria is sort of the like branded name of this rosé. You know, a lot of times winemakers or wine producers will have, you know, their name on the bottle, of course, like who made it, Tumoresca, but then they like to name it just because it gives a little more like marketing, you know, marketing uh, pull. And so the Califuria, I'm probably saying that wrong, but it takes its name from the over seven, 700 bays that are located along the Apulian Peninsula. So the region really has a long tradition of producing rosé wines made from Negro Amaro. And honestly, I mean, honestly, they all believe that it this Negro Amaro rosé is best expressed at its full potential when it's made near the sea. So that's why, and I pointed out where this winery is located, right on that peninsula in Puglia, because this is just really it. It's really showing off, right? <laughs> really showing off. So anytime you're having your, your Negro Maro growing along the Adriatic coast, you're, you know you're going to be having some fun rosé. Um, yes, and also as another exciting point, this wine also received 91 points from Venice. So it's pretty exciting. Um, I'll read a quick excerpt here, but uh, the reviewer um, for this one said that they experienced a lot more dried dried flowers and spices on the palate, which I think was interesting. I feel like if I were to let this sit a little bit, I'd maybe pick up a little more of that. Hmm. And then of course, uh, there's a lovely soft texture, but it's really accented by the zesty notes of the acidity and maybe a little bit of that orange citrus that we mentioned earlier in the palate and the flavor. Yes, very long linger, juicy finish was kind of what they said here. All right. Very, okay, and in the chat here, Diana says, very well balanced between fruit and acidity, no tannins and low alcohol. Yes, I can, 
concur with that for sure. Yeah, we got 12% alcohol here. So it's, you know, not, it's not supposed to be blowing you out of the water, but it's supposed to be a really lovely, you know, food uh, kind of pairing, aperitif, you could have it by itself. You know, it's got a lot of different uses. So with that being said, someone mentioned that they love the cheese with it. So if you haven't already, take a little bite of your cheese here. This, the first one is gonna be the Pecorino uh, Toscano, three months aged. So try it out. We'll talk about what makes us a good pairing in a second. And while you're eating that, I was going to say the other thing that I don't know is it reminds me of the smell of clean laundry. Mm. Oh, I like that. I when like you that. smell like, and especially if you, when you pour a new glass, like right at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, it really has like a, it smells like clean laundry. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so fresh and refreshing. <laughs> you know, it makes me think of the, um, from like different, like, you know, movies of like the Italian coast or the Greek coast where they have like the white sheets and the clothing just hanging out in the, in the breeze. This is kind of what we're having in a glass, right? <laughs> this clean laundry on the Italian coast drying in the breeze. I love it. Kim, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, so when I, when I read about the flavors of strawberries and watermelon and lavender and whatnot, is this all coming from the grapes or like the bees that carry different pollens to to pollinate the, the flowers that produce the grapes? Or do vintners ever do some sort of an additive to the grapes that gives more of that flavor of a different type of fruit? Mm, that's a great question. Okay, so um, with, gosh, the flavors in wine, they... One, I will say it's very subjective. So what we're all smelling is things that we have created scent memories around. So there are, you know, you could be saying like, this smells like my great grandmother's perfume and like no one can challenge you, right? So there's a little bit of that, just subjectivity. Um, I will say that, you know, the in including the idea of bees and kind of what they are bringing to, you know, the, the flowering uh, vines and that sort of thing is so interesting. I feel like that was something I would have to really deep dive into. I've never thought of that. So that could be a possibility. Um, but I will say that initially most of the flavors, especially um, just with rosé, something that's, you know, very youthful is you are going to be getting most of the pure fruit flavors from the grapes. And that's just because it's a youthful uh, wine. It's made to be consumed and enjoyed in that way. And, um, you know, for a lot of your rosés, you're not gonna also, you're not gonna be putting them in oak barrels. So your winemaking techniques are gonna be affecting it too much. Um, sort of depends on what you're doing with body. If you're doing some malolactic fermentation and um, I don't know what, I don't know all the details on that. I could not find the information for these wines, but um, that could be a possibility. Uh, the other thing you mentioned was, What's the last thing you said? Additives, like if you've tasted strawberries, might they have added a strawberry to the vat, for instance, to give that extra push in that direction or not? Uh, I would say definitely not. So um, I, it is so hard sometimes to be like, how are there so many aromas in wine? But you know, it's really, again, coming from the grape varieties. It's coming from what's it's picking up from the land. We'll taste more of that with the the next wine, kind of what we're getting from the land. Um, and then also, yeah, just mostly the grape varieties and the winemaking and the land, of course. Those kind of the three main things that give wine its flavors. Um, I would say most winemakers are not adding any additive flavors. Uh, it's That would be outlawed, I would think, in, in all of Europe and most winemaking regions around the world. And um, yeah, so I, but I would say that it's possible that could be occurring with like very low grade, very, very, very cheap wine because you're just trying to make it taste good. But usually that's more in the form of adding sugar. So no one's really adding flavors, but, um, but yeah, it's a great question. But I, I would assure you that these are all ex coming from the grape varieties. There's no crazy uh, additives in here at all. Great question, thank you. Alrighty. So getting over to our cheese. So we have the Pecorino Toscano aged three months, and this is a hard sheep's milk cheese. And, um, you know, the, actually the word pecora in Italian means cheese or sheep, sorry. So that's why it's called Pecorino. Um, 
but yes, yeah, so Pecorino is a, you know, primarily produced throughout Southern and Central Italy. And this is where the landscape really lends itself to herding sheep. So, um, you know, I don't know if there's any, you know, cheese making in Puglia, but we're kind of adjacent to that area in terms of, you know, the cheese and the wine being near each other um, in production. But, you know, typically uh, Pecorino Toscano is a very sturdy cheese. It's nutty, usually has a hint of saltiness with an underlying savory and sweet flavors. And the, that savory sweet sort of juxtaposition really intensifies with age. So you'll notice, um, you know, we have a three month aged cheese here. If you were to have a, a, a not aged or even one that's aged even more, maybe six months, I think we also carry that as well at, Calver at the La Cheesery. Um, but if you were to have one that is even more aged, then you'll notice that the salty sweet dichotomy gets more intense on the palate. Um, so yeah, and I mean, this is a cheese that it's great to eat on its own. It's also something you could shave over some pasta. Um, it's also really apparently very good with Italian sausage and fennel, which I could totally see. So speaking of that, um, you know, we have a wine here with, you know, we said some floral notes. I didn't mention herbal, but I feel like you could get a little bit of thyme out of this one. This was a tasting, uh, the thyme was a tasting note from the winery itself, actually. So I could buy it. But because Pecorino Toscano has, um, you know, a really kind of nutty aroma to it, it does well with, of course, some herbal flavors and, of course, with your nice fruit. So I think that's why, flavor-wise, it kind of makes a good pairing, right? Mm. So as you're tasting, you also notice that when you're chewing the cheese, it has this, like, slightly gritty mouth coating feeling, right? It's almost kind of there's some grittiness to it. And I feel like that's a little bit of the salt coming out here in the cheese, but it's also something that I think makes it a really good textural pairing to the Tumoresca. So when you're having a sip of this, you know, you're getting this pretty good amount of city that's very palate cleansing and the body's not too full. It's maybe medium, maybe a little bit on the lighter side. So it depends on kind of your, your own range in your head. But uh, something that I like about this is that even though you have this slight grittiness in the cheese, that acidity kind of cuts through all of that. And that's what helps it become um, a really nice pairing on the palate. You have a little juxtaposition of texture and the uh, rip ripping acidity. All right. So give me a wave if you enjoyed this, uh, this pairing. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. It was excellent. We really enjoyed it. Great, thank you. We yeah. love the information you provided. Awesome. You're welcome. All right, so what questions do you have? We're about to move on to our um, Provence Rosé. So as you all are finishing up your Tomoresca, pour yourself some of the Paradis. This is from Provence. And as you are doing that, um, would love to take a, qu a question or two. So feel free to unmute or pop into the chat while everyone's uh, doing that. I just wanted to make a quick comment where we have a duck prosciutto and um, that pecorino goes really well with it wow. as well. So yeah. <laughs> Nice. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Hmm, the Puglia as a as a wine area, as a place to visit. <clears throat> Some of the areas uh, south of there are not so attractive to visit. Um, is the Puglia area um, fun as a place to visit? Is it enjoyable? Oh man, I personally have not been there. However, um, I do have like a friend of a friend that used to live there and it's, I mean, it's the coast, right? It's just yeah. beautiful. <laughs> so yeah, and I would say that it's also probably not, I think it's, it's not as popular, I would say tourist wise, but I think it's probably growing. They're also known for, um, you'd have to look it up for photos, but there's these white houses with the, um, like, like thatched roofs made with straw and they're circular. And so that is actually a very popular thing to go visit. And it's in particular town in Puglia. So I think that's a little bit of the tourist attraction there. Sure, okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, everyone. So pour yourself a little glass of that Provence Rosé and let's get into it. All righty, I'm gonna pull up another uh, map here. Yay, Diane said they're coming to buy more. Woo, I love that. <laughs> we will have it available for sure. Okay, so here we go. Okay. 
Okay, so here we are. Our next wine is the Chateau Paradis. This is the Cote d'Anne Provence Rosé 2020. Mm. All right, so you can see here, I have a map of Provence on the screen and um, this black circle kind of shows that, that giant area, the Appalachian where it comes from, but specifically that black dot is about where the winery is. So um, I will zoom in just a little bit, help you guys out. Um, but you can see it's actually um, pretty close to this town called uh, Aine et Provence. I really am terrible at the French pronunciations, but I respect it. Um, so it's very close to this area. It's kind of near um, one of the rivers here as well. So that's just something to note in terms of where it is located. So popping back out here. All right, so Chateau Paradis. Um, this, this area, or sorry, I should say this, I, um, <laughs> sorry, this uh, winery, that's what I'm trying to say, is, um, has actually transferred quite a few hands, but right now it's owned by the Thébline family. They own the property. Um, they seem like they're quite a family in the Provence area, but um, this area of Provence, it's a, it's a section in Provence, it's called the Côte yeah, Cote d'Anne Provence. I'm so sorry for the pronunciation. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this area is a um, an AOP or an AOC. It's the uh, Appalachian controlled area, which is designated for rosés, of course. And in this area, the primary grape varieties, which is part of what we're having in this wine, are Cinso, Grenache, and Syrah. So you have to include at least two of the main grape varieties in there. So in this wine, of course, we have. Uh, Syrah and Grenache. And then um, you're also allowed to include in the blend Cabernet Sauvignon, Carignan, um, uh, Cunois, which is a great variety I've not heard of, and Mouvedra. So you can, you can, and also Vermentino, which you can see as part of this blend. So you can blend in other things, but you have to have, you know, at least um, Cinso, Grenache, or Syrah as the main part of your blend. So um, this particular uh, chateau and this area has limestone, you know, mountain soils. So where the winery is located, you can see those mountains in the picture there in the distance. That is a photo of the winery. So um, all of the grapes are growing on limestone deposits, uh, which is limestone deposits in the soil that have run off from the mountains. And so with that, you know, limestone is really well is known as a great thing to have in your soil for winemaking. And I think that's Personally, that's what I believe really contributes some of the minerality into this into this Provence rosé. So, mm, so with that being said, take a sip here or take a sniff. Sorry, take a sniff and um, start to kind of feel what we're getting out of this wine. All right, I see some stuff in the. Ooh, all right, this one is more grapefruit and it's very dry. That's what we have in the chat so far. So, I will say that this rosé was made with a direct pressing method, which is why we have this very lighter kind of color compared at least to the first one and of course the last. And so the direct pressing method is, you know, you're pressing the, the, the crushing the grapes, you're kind of letting the, letting the juice run through the skins and it's picking up a little bit of color and you're not keeping the skins on there for any maceration. So you're just getting the runoff and that is um, why you're getting this lighter color. So take a sniff here. It's a very lovely pale peach color, right? Mmm, I totally agree with the grapefruit. That is the first thing that I smelled. Hmm. I would agree that there's also some peach, maybe apricot in here, some stone fruit. There's something like a really nice ripe soft fruit along with the grapefruit. There's the citrus and the, the stone fruit. Mmm. And of course, this is probably coming a lot from the Syrah and the Grenache, since those are the bigger part of the blend. Um, I'll also say that adding Vermentino in here, you know, Vermentino can have a really nice body to it. And so, and like just, I don't know, it can have a good body. It just adds a little bit of structure. Usually that's why you're adding in a little bit of a, a white to a blend like that, because you're wanting to give something to the palate. So we'll see when we take it. Uh, a little bit of apple I'm smelling. Ooh. Red or white apple? <laughs> like a really light, not like a Granny Smith, like a, like a Fuji Mama. or a Honeycrisp. Nice. Love it. Oh, 
Jolene in the uh, chat says they're getting plum. All right. <laughs> Diana would love to use this instead of bubbly in an Aperol spritz. I feel like that could be really fun. <laughs> I mean, wow, that could be really good. I could see it. I mean, especially because you are getting the grapefruit aromas here. There's something citrusy about it. Maybe even leaning towards orangey. I don't know. I don't, maybe, maybe more lemon. I don't know. I haven't decided. All right. So if you haven't already, take a sip. Honeysuckle. Mmm. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Ooh. So I feel like a lot of times Provence rosés can be described as very light and airy. And I feel like this is a fun example of that. So for me, what makes it very light and airy is that you have this pretty intense acidity. It's quite dry. So it's not resting on your palate too hard, right? It's like, it's just kind of sitting there. I'm getting some really good fruit flavors easy, even as I'm talking and my mouth is still watering after taking that sip, you know, 30 seconds ago. Um, the other thing is that the body of uh, Provence rosés is always a lot of fun. So to me, it always leans a little bit more towards full. And I think that's mostly just coming from the grape varieties. I think there's also some, you know, winemaking you know, techniques that they're probably doing in here, but all I know for sure is that they did do the direct pressing. So I'm not sure if they had any other, you know, malactic fermentation or anything like that going on. I don't really think so, but um, I do think the body is really coming from the, uh, the, uh, the, wine, the grape varieties here. So thoughts on the palate, anyone here, anyone, were they surprised when they smelled it and then the effect of its flavor? All right, no one was surprised. <laughs> That's all right. Well, since we're uh, tasting, we should also dive into the cheese. So the cheese that goes with this one, and uh, I will say as a caveat, feel free to try all the wines with all the cheeses and just kind of see what you like the best. But this is what I'm thinking goes well. So this cheese, uh, our next cheese is gonna be the Seal Cove Chev, which is Chev is a term for goat cheese. So it's from uh, Maine. So Seal Cove Farm. Uh, it's this lovely cheese with rosemary on it. And I we actually sell at Calvert Woodley a few different flavors of this cheese. We have the, um, we have the, dark, the garlic and dill, which is amazing. We have um, some of the peppercorn. We have a plain version, which is just lovely. And then of course the rosemary. And so I picked the rosemary because I've thought that with the, the lightness of this Provence uh, rosé, you would want a little bit of flavor in your cheese, but not too much. And having that mixture of herbalness, especially with um, the minerality of this wine, which I forgot to point out in the tasting, you do get a little bit of a sense of that minerality. I feel more on the, after you've sipped the wine, you get a little bit of that, um, i trying to describe minerality, um, a little bit more of that like kind of, yeah, like stony sort of like aroma or flavor. Not that I've ever licked a rock, but I feel like I can kind of picture it. <laughs> All right, but yes, yeah, so anyway, I feel like the rosemary in, in terms of like tones of like aromas sort of kind of match with the, the minerality. So take a bite of that cheese, try your wine with it, and also pay attention to the texture. Mm. <laughs> oh man, Matthew says we love this cheese and so does our cat Zoe. Oh, Zoe, I'm so happy. <laughs> you're joining in on our tasting. That is so fun. <laughs> yeah. So as you're taking a bite, what I want you to notice is that, wow, my mouth is really watering. It was so good. So what I want you to notice on the palate is that this goat cheese is very soft, very creamy. And so a really good uh, match for a wine in that term is having something that is dry and has a lot of like ripping acidity. Just kind of said for the first one, you had good acidity to kind of match with the cheese. Um, this one has just that minerality, which I think almost enhances the feeling of the acidity a little bit, just as a kind of a play on texture and smell. And then of course, um, that, you know, when you mix, mix it with the creaminess of the cheese, that's why it's like so fun. So good. I agree. The cheese is lovely. Yes. Well, I will share a little more about the cheese. So Seal Cove is Seal Cove Farms is a, um, a farm based in Maine, up in Maine in the U.S. And um, they have, they've been making, gosh, they've been making cheese since uh, 1976. 
And we just recently got into the store, uh, Carlos, who's the, the head of our cheesery, you've probably all seen him. Anyway, he's um, super pumped about these cheeses. He's very excited about them and they are so good. But the really cool thing is um, they really focus on the goat cheese and they don't really sell that much outside of Maine. So we're quite lucky to actually have it at Calvert Woodley. Um, and the woman there that owns it, she likes to say that her goats that make the, the cheese are the happiest goats alive. So she kind of lets them roam around. They have like a good amount to roam, of course, you know, she wants to keep them close by just, you know, for predators and that sort of thing. But, um, but yes, yeah, she has a really happy, you know, uh, herd of goats. And I really think that comes out in the flavor. So yeah, cheers to that. <laughs> All righty, everyone. So I want to make sure that um, we're, we might go a little bit past 730. So if you have to uh, leave a little bit early, that is okay. This is being recorded. So you can watch it later. Don't worry. Um, but I'm going to make sure we get over to the next wine and have some time to spend on that. So our last wine is going to be the Chateau de Segri from Tavel. So please pour yourself a little bit of this one and make sure you have your last cheese ready, which is going to be that aged Manchego. And um, as I'm pouring this and kind of getting settled, are there any questions? What questions do you all have? So, I don't, this is Danielle, I don't have a question, but a comment. Um, I found the, the goat cheese almost a little overpowering on the, the Aix en Provence um, wine, because they're so light mm -hmm. and, um, and it wasn't the, ro the rosemary worked really well with it, but the, the chef has such a strong flavor. Um, but trying it with the first wine was actually a really good combination um, because the, the fruit was so much stronger. And so it, it was able to kind of hold its own with the acidity. Um, so if you haven't tried that combination, try it. Um, just to say like it's a, it's a different option, but um, you know the, the Provence rosés are frequently just so, they're light and they're not necessarily that fruit heavy. And, um, and I think we are all, we have different palates, right? So we're all kind of sensitive to the things we pick up on. And, um, and, I, and I, I think the first wine um, held its own a little better with the chef, which was fantastic, by the way. Yay, also, I love that. Yes, like I said, try them all in different combinations, um, but try these two. I think you'll have a lot of fun. You can always go back to it at the end. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so we have a question already about the third wine. We're talking about longer maceration and uh, I'll get into it. I'll explain what that's all about. Um, Cause it's sort of, sort of, okay. So I'm gonna pull up our little screen again. Oh, okay, so before we get into this one, um, Luis said, I have a mental block with really red rosé. They make me think of really sweet wines. I would say that, um, yeah, that can kind of be the case, especially if your only experience with darker rosés is sweet, but I will say that that's not always the case. And Tavel, it's usually not the case. I would say Tavel is dry um, and it is, it, I like to call it the red wine lover's rosé. So we'll get into why in just a second. <laughs> You'll notice when you taste it, you're like, hmm, this is, this is more intense. Okay. All right, so we're getting over to our thing. Okay. Alrighty. So Chateau de Segri is in Tavel, as I mentioned, and this is a sub-region of the Southern Rhone. So I'm going to zoom in here. This, this uh, circle here is where it is. Moving in here. So you'll see um, some of the areas nearby Tavel. Tavel is just this little kind of boat shape here. Um, it's right next to Lirac. Um, and it's also near, you know, Chateau de Pop is on the other side of the river over here. And then we have Vacarez nearby. And this larger area here is just kind of the Cote de Rhone, uh, you know, IGT sort of thing. So uh, I would say uh, Tavel, if, if you're thinking of just France, it's close to Avignon. So of, of, the, of that area, you can kind of place it on there. So pull it back out. All right. So this is our wine here. And, um, and Tavel, you know, it's, it's a small region, but it's actually the first 
a designated appellation for only rosé wine in France. So that was kind of, you know, it's been its thing, I think, from almost the beginning. And what it's known for is um, having higher alcohol and of course a blend of you know the typical Rhone grapes and also really good acidity. So the interesting thing about this rosé is that because it is a little bit more intense, it actually can age. So and when it does, you know, you can it can develop some savory and nutty flavors over time. So back to the beginning when I was talking about what gives wine and its aromas and its flavors, um, that fourth thing was aging. And so of course on this Tavel, it's from 2020. So we're not getting any of the aging notes yet, but if you were to get another bottle and let it sit for maybe three years and just kind of see what happens, then you'll, you'll notice a difference. <laughs> It'll be a little more nutty. So it's a lot of fun. It's a good, definitely a really good food rosé, but something that could be enjoyed alone. So definitely take a snip here. Um, and as a, uh, just a fun tidbit, this was Ernest Hemingway's favorite like rosé or favorite wine, I think it was kind of his thing. So anyway, just, you know, you can just picture that. Dusty Books and uh, Tavel. I don't know. It's kind of what I think of. So um, the Chateau de Sigri, of course, especially, um, this is owned by Henry D. Uh, Lanzac, and he is the cousin of the Delmore family who own Domaine de la Mor Morodie, Mor sorry, Mordori, <laughs> Mordori. So he's the cousin of the family that owns uh, that Mordori uh, Chateau. And we also have their Tavel as well. So it's kind of fun. You could get a bottle from Chateau de Segre and then one from Domaine de la Mordore, and you will kind of get to taste, you know, kind of all in the family. So anyway, um, Chateau de Segre was founded in 1994. And they focus on, you know, they always say, all the winemakers are always like, we're using our best grapes and the best terroir. And so for them, this is up on the windy Valangu Plateau. So while they are, you know, in a, in the Tavel area, they have a little bit of elevation. And so what they have up here is some really nice um, limestone, pebble soil, um, sand and clay base. So there's a few different kind of mixtures in their soil here, which I think just really gives the wine, um, maybe a little bit into that minerality. I mean, it's, it, it's just Tavel. Tavel is Tavel. You can't really compare it to anything, right? Um, and the other thing to note too, is that all of their grapes are coming off of 60 year old vines. So we've got some really good concentration in this, in these, in these wines, because you're having, a uh, you know, old vines, which means their roots are really deep and they're, you know, pretty healthy. So that's a really good thing. All right. So let's get into tasting this one. Let's see. Oh, we have people talking in the chat. I'm in love with this wine's color. I so agree. Yes, take a sniff if you haven't already. Oh, uh, yes. So I'm um, clarifying about Ernest Hemingway's favorite. It was Tavel. I don't know if he had a specific vineyard or chateau, but it was Tavel in general was kind of his uh, drink of choice. <laughs> All right, so I'm taking a sniff here. Um, and oh, this is, gosh, this is the most important part. So um, as I mentioned earlier, how rosé was made, this one is made in this um, Sangui method, which is the classic bleeding wine method. So they deep stemmed it, they you know macerated the juice in a tank, and then they sort of drained it out after that night. And that's what gave you this really deep, dark color. And so um, the other component of when you're macerating want grape juice and skins together is also the temperature. And so for a lot of rosés and some reds, especially what you're going to do is keep it at a very cool temperature. So you don't want fermentation to start right away. But what you do want is that extraction of color and tannins out of the juice. And so that is why, you know, Tavel has this deep colors because you've macerated it at a cool, at a cool temperature overnight to really get that that deep color. So, you know, the other thing with that is that um, some people are mentioning a little bit of tannins and there, you know, is a little bit of a touch here. And that is again, because you did macerate for, for a good, you know, overnight and you did it, you did it, um, you did get a lot of that extraction. So that's part of the reason. All right, take a sniff here if you haven't already. I saw we had bacon. Anyone else here? I see Chris unmuted, what's up? Uh, uh, just a, a quick question. Um, do they do this at room temperature or is this controlled fermentation at a lower temperature? Great question. So this is controlled at a lower temperature. Um, they're and in cement tanks. So um, cement tanks are used 
for maceration for whatever reason. I think you can use steel, but you're not gonna use oak for that as, you know, that's gonna be something you might do a little later and move the wine into, but yeah, definitely controlled and at a lower than average room temperature, definitely. I don't know the exact temperature, but cool, cool enough that your fermentation will not start, but you're just getting the extraction from the, the skins into the juice. Exactly. All right, so speaking of tasting notes here, we have- I was just saying, this is Danielle real quick. Um, uh, nose of blue cheese. Oh, blue cheese nose. All right. Yes, we have tobacco in the chat. Someone mentioned bacon early on, which, you know, comes from Syrah. Syrah kind of has that bacony aroma sometimes, right? <laughs> oh, this is someone that's made with... To me, this is, this is kind of um, like a strong... Um, salty sea breeze it's very singular and uncomplicated like I don't smell a lot of layers of fruit and floral I like that description it's very straightforward yeah mm -hmm. all right so take a sip if you haven't already we got our flavor in mm. So something to notice that I'm just sort of picking up a little bit on the palate is that you'll notice that maybe you have a little bit of um, it's like texture or grittiness on your tongue. It's sort of like a, a drying feeling like you licked dust, not that, I mean, it is a dry wine. Dry is a, um, a designation of how much sugar is in a wine and there is zero. But for this one, you're getting a drying texture, which is different. And so there could be a little bit of tannins in here. I, I don't get a ton, but I would maybe expect just a little bit. I also think it'd be fun to explore other Tavelles and see if they kind of pick that up, but I don't get a lot. I just get in for my palate um, more of a, like a, just a slight texture, which could be hinting at that. But we also had someone comment about alcohol here and I'm gonna pull up, I don't actually remember what it was. 14.5, yes. So <laughs> there is more alcohol in this one. And um, I think that's just coming from the great varieties too as well. I mean, Syrah can get up there, right? Um, but when you were tasting, you know, kind of going back to what I talked about in the beginning about looking for different um, structural components when you're tasting. So we talked about acidity. Um, we looked, talked about a little bit about body with um, the Provence Rosé. And I will say that when you're tasting for body, you're looking again on a spectrum. And you're looking from, uh, is it light bodied and feels more like water, it's very light, or is it fuller bodied and feels more like a heavy cream? That is more um, kind of like your spectrum to kind of think about. And then uh, for this Tavel, of course, we're getting into a little bit more alcohol. So if you're tasting a wine and you feel a little bit of a burn here in your chest or retronasally, you get a little bit of a burn, just like if you were to have taken a shot of liquor, um, that is an indication that the wine's a little bit higher in alcohol than normal. Um, you know, anything over 14 is usually considered high. And so, um, you know, this one being 14.5 is, you know, just kind of getting up there, especially for a, a rosé, right? But I think that's what makes it kind of fun with food. Okay, so Diana in the chat says, a mellow aroma, didn't prepare me for the intense taste. Uh, cries out for funky foods, bacon and blue cheese, absolutely. And um, possibly something with heat, like Thai or Vietnamese food, thinking fish sauce. Oh gosh, I love it. I, I agree with the fish sauce. There could be a little bit of nice like soy fishiness kind of going on here in terms of like a pairing, not like in the wine. Um, but yeah, I, I do think like a classic um, pairing with Tavel could also be Asian cuisine and that was mentioned. So totally agree with that. All right, but speaking of that, let's try, uh, if you haven't already, try your cheese. So we have aged manchego here. Mm. All right. Mm. Mm. All right. So uh, manchego. It's a cheese that comes from the La Manca area in Spain. And the sheep that make the cheese are called manchega. So that is why it's called manchego cheese. It's kind of a fun thing. Um, but yes, so this is a sheep's milk cheese. And um, 
and you will, and it's, and it's age 12 months. So that's just something to pay attention to. At Calvert Woodley, we carry a few different aging of the Manchego. So you can actually go up to like 14 months and I think maybe down to three or just regular. So definitely check it out and kind of compare, but similar to the Pecorino uh, Toscano, as you age it, it's gonna develop just different flavors. So the for the Manchego, it um, will get more mellow flavors. It'll be more rounded, but at a younger version, it's usually a little more sour cream, a little more intense, can have a, a really nice mixture of sweet and tangy, a little bit of hay and a little bit of grassiness. So that's just something to look for in this one. But of course, this one being aged 12 months, it is, um, it's gonna be more mellow. It's not gonna have as pungent of flavors, but it's gonna start to gain more caramel and um, nuttiness which in terms of flavor is kind of what I was thinking would be fun um, and the cheesier is what we think would be fun with this wine is because you do have this um, good nuttiness. It's kind of a, a fun pairing with the, the fruit and just kind of the, the singularity of this Tavel. Um, I will say as well is that this wine or this cheese does give you again that slightly drying texture. Mm, I think it's probably coming from the saltiness. It's also just kind of the nature of sheep's milk, which you know, when you take a sip on the palate, it's sort of almost matched a little bit by the wine. So I don't know. Ah, Jolene in the chat. Is anyone else getting truffle from the cheese? Um, I kind of agree. I feel like now that you've said it, I taste a little bit of truffle. And I will say that um, for this tasting, we were, I was considering kind of throwing in a truffle cheese, but I know truffle is not everyone's favorite. And so I will say that if you get a chance, especially because you know, we're open this weekend and you still have your wine. Um, we just got in a new uh, cheese at Cowher Woodley called, um, it's a Taligio, which we've had, but we have the truffle version. So if you come in and get some of that, try it with this wine because it is really good and it's a lot of fun. So I love that you all are kind of mentioning truffles in the Manchego because that was sort of what I was thinking would be good with this, but I know that truffle can be so like polarizing. So I wanted to make sure we had cheeses that everyone enjoyed. Um, but yes, truffles mixed with walnuts is what Diana said about the Manchego. So anyway, um, yeah, that is like, that is what I have for you all in terms of just the rosés and the cheese pairing. And um, what I would really, you know, we still have, we're a little bit over time, but I'm here to chat with you all and kind of um, answer anything else that you have. And of course, I'll be emailing you uh, after probably tomorrow morning and you will have my email so you can always follow up later. So are there any, what kind of questions do you have? What questions do you have for me? Not a question, but an observation. I, actually, we actually felt like the wine made the Manchego taste more peppery. Mm. Sort of changed that edge a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that you're thinking about how is the wine changing the cheese because that can be, that, that's a really interesting thing with food and wine pairing, right? Is you're having a really interesting um, juxtaposition between the two and really they can change each other. And that's why it's kind of a fun thing to explore. Any other observations or questions here? Can you recommend a good sparkling rosé? Oh, yes. So um, my favorite in the store is the um, Boogie Cerdon. The, Bougie Cerdon, gosh, I'm so terrible with pronunciations. Um, we, it has actually has a, a hint of sugar to it. It's not like overly sweet, but it does have a little bit with, with it, but it's made in the um, ancestral method, which is really fun. Um, it's just like a different way of ferment, ferment, fermenting and making a sparkling wine and has a little bit of yeastiness to it. But I really enjoy that one. Um, we do have a sparkling rosé on the shelf and I can't remember the name of it, but I will uh, link that in the email out to everyone. And um, mm -hmm. yes, and I will also say that new this year, and this is a kind of a side note, but um, there is now allowed, there, you're now allowed to make Prosecco rosé out of the Prosecco world. So before you couldn't, um, you know, call rosé, Prosecco rosé, it was like a, it was a law in the area in terms of winemaking. But just this year they changed that. So you'll start to see more um, rosé Proseccos on the market. So that'll be kind of fun to try as well. And that's just something that's starting to come out. But we don't have too many of those yet because they're, you know, 
with all of with everyone kind of quickly wanting to get their wines over here before you know the the supposed impending taxes which are now done away with but at the time that meant that all of the ports are full of sh uh, ships that need to be um you know uh need to be unloaded that are just all backed up so it may be some time until we get those <laughs> funny you brought up the prosecco rose i i was just in a total wine yesterday and noticed a lot more of them mm -hmm. uh, do you, what is it typically Pinot Noir in that or what what do they blend to? Yes, great question. Um, I honestly don't know off the top of my head what they're using to really do that, but let me think about this because I just tried one the other day. Um, mm -hmm. I might have to get back to you on that, but I feel like I should know. I mean, of course there's Glara in there, um, so you have to have a majority of Glara, but you do, I just pulled it up. Yes. So you do, you can include Pinot Noir. So that is the other grape, but you have to have Glara. So Glara is still the main grape that's included in Prosecco. You can include up to, as my notes here say, 10 to 15% of Pinot Noir. And, um, what, what other, uh, areas would you recommend to get a great rosé from? Mm. Uh, um, let me think about this. There's so many good ones. I, I love, so there's, well, there's one particular rosé that I really enjoy. So if you like the Tavel and you like the darker type, at Calvert Woodley, we have a rosé called Burgo Vejo, and it's really affordable, but it's delicious. And it is from, um, uh, I think Rioja. I believe. Um, but I love that. That's a really fun one because it's just different. Um, they, oh, I'm putting that in the chat for everyone. And Diane, Diana says Germany or Austria for good rosés too. Yes. I mean, the thing is, I feel that with rosés is that everyone's kind of exploring and making them and they've really, you know, come to terms in the past, you know, six years. And so I think that it's really fun to try as many different areas as you possibly can. So if you've had enough of Provence and you kind of understand it, then move on to other things. I personally really love Italian rosés because there's so many different, you know, regions that you can try from. So we have a Piedmont rosé from Vira actually in Calvert Woodley. And I know I keep like saying Calvert Woodley, but like, um, you know, that's where I work. So, <laughs> so I want to keep talking about that. But yeah, the Vira rosé is really fun. It's definitely a food rosé. It's super dry, very kind of piercing. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy that as well. So yeah. All right. I know I've been talking a lot, but we also live next door to the state of Virginia, which has a great wine industry. And there are some fantastic rosés from Virginia. Um, Linden Vineyards, for example, has a phenomenal rosé with a lot of that limestone and minerality. So if that's what you like in it, um, there's some vineyards on the eastern shore of Virginia um, that have a different terroir. And um, so I would say like, if you're looking at, looking at local wines, look at vineyards that focus on their terroir and focus on um, highlighting the, the flavor that comes from that, um, that ground that they're growing in. Because there's some really interesting wines and things that you can buy locally as well, um, outside of the US too, but um, <laughs> you know, right in our backyard as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's awesome. I love that recommendation. Um, oops, how do I get out? I went to full screen. All right. So um, I had another question in the chat here. Uh, oh, Australia, yes. I mean, like I said, rosé from anywhere. You really just got to explore and you'll find some good stuff. But rosé is from Oregon. Um, yes, rosé is from Oregon are a thing. Uh, at Calvary Woodley, we have one. It's from Elk Cove. And I'll write that, write that in here. Oh, Elk Cove. I'll send you all a link to all the rosés so you can take a look later. But um, I think the thing with uh, Oregon is that because they focus very strongly on their um, their sustainability practices and being good stewards of the land, you know, they tend to spend a little more money when they're making their wine, which means that their prices need to be a little bit higher. And so for rosés, I think there's still a little bit of a perception that you know I'm not going to spend you know, way over $20 to get a rosé. I'm going to, I want to aim for under 20. And so sometimes we get, you know, they're a little bit priced out, but we have one uh, right now and it's, it's nice, it's pleasant and it's a Pinot Noir. So, which is, you know, classic from Willamette in Oregon. So I recommend you try that too. <laughs> Thank you for that. We're from Oregon. So 
appreciate that. Um, so we'll have to try that one from the Willana Valley. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Oh, and we have some people saying they're heading to Oregon later this year. So definitely hit up the wine regions <laughs> for sure. Hmm. All righty, everyone. Well, we are coming up on the end of our time. And I just want to say a really big thank you from myself and from Calvert Woodley for supporting us, for supporting all, all of our wine tastings. And um, yeah, just for coming out. I mean, I really hope that you enjoy, continue to enjoy your rosés and your cheeses. And, you know, please, I'll be, you know, I email you all the time about tasting. So feel free to reach out anytime with comments um, about the tasting. If you have a, if you tried another cheese with the wines and you have some other, um, some other uh, tasting notes you want to share, please share them. I love to hear. So yes, I just, yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone in the chat. I'm loving it. <laughs> Thank you. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you. We had a great time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That was great. Good job. Appreciate it. It was thank awesome. You. Thank you so much. It was thank great. You. And we look forward to doing it again. All right. Cheers. Very fun. Mm -hmm. thank, Bye. You. Bye. thank you. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome, everyone. All right. Are you raving, Ray? Yep.